I want to thank all of you for coming. Coming to help us share in the grief and celebrate the life well lived of Kay. There are so many here that are close friends, ones that she has worked with and shared with, and I sincerely thank you for being here. We're honored to have with us here our Governor Roy Cooper, former Governor Jim Hunt, also Senator Richard Burr, with whom Kay served and who is the senior senator of North Carolina. We also have with us other friends of Kay's from the Senate, Amy Klobuchar, a senator from Missouri, um, I mean from Minnesota, excuse me, uh, and who is a presidential candidate, forgive me for that. <clears throat> Claire McCaskill, who is here from Missouri, Mary Landrew from Louisiana, and Blanche Lincoln from Arkansas. All of those people served together with Kay in the United States Senate. I noticed Josh Stein was here as I came in, which means that there are probably a number of other elected officials and public servants that are here to honor Kay. And I want to thank you for your presence here today. I also want us to thank the staff. <clears throat> Kay was fortunate to have wonderfully talented people in her North Carolina Senate office, in her U.S. Senate office, and in the campaigns where she spent considerable time trying to represent the people of North Carolina. She had once said that if you are going to do something, you need to have fun doing it. Well, those staff members were a part of making her life fun. They were a part of what Kay kept what kept Kay energized and really engaged in doing her work in the United States Senate. And there are a number of them here. If you are a person who uh, was a member of her staff in the Senate or in her campaigns, I'd like for you to rise, please. Thank you. Kay brought life into the lives of many people, and we will all miss her. But I'm going to let our children explain some of their perspective of the light that she gave to us as a family. I'm Jeanette Higgin, Kay's eldest daughter. Mom loved to travel. She always had a new place she wanted to go visit, sometimes nearby, sometimes far away. Trips were to see gorgeous mountains, to learn about different cultures, or simply to visit friends. Sometimes they were planned months in advance. Often they were spur of the moment, and they always, almost always included family. That excitement about a new trip was always there. One of the things about travel is that it's never predictable. While many trips go smoothly, a lot don't. Mom always had a great attitude no matter the circumstances. A rainstorm soaked everything on our first family backpacking trip. We still had many more. She encouraged the extended family to go hiking in the snow, then started a snowball fight. She knew she and my grandfather would want a lunch coma nap after a morning at the beach so she planned kids' activities we could do to not bother the adults. When our passports were stolen at a market in Ecuador, she made an adventure out of getting new ones. That sense of adventure sometimes led us off the beaten path, much to the chagrin of the travel organizers. She didn't want to wait for the bus in Korea on a state senate trip, so she said we'd walk and use the subway. Some people seemed surprised, others nervous. Mom just said, Jeanette knows the way, and off we went. Of course, they were right to be worried. Mom's sense of direction was shockingly poor. <laughs> Just ask any of her staff about her backseat driving. Her first few weeks in Washington, she would call me at 4 a.m. California time, completely lost in DC traffic and hoping for some guidance. 
I've been told one of my strengths is my ability to roll with the punches. I know I got that from my mom. I learned through many travel delays and fiascos that eventually we will get home. And while we're at it, we may as well swing by Waffle House since it's two in the morning and we have a two hour drive. This idea of we'll get there eventually carried me through undergrad and my PhD. I still tell people who are nervous about traveling with kids that at some point, no matter how miserable the flight seems, you'll land and get off the plane. Mom never knew what life would throw at her, and that was okay. Just like in travel, she'd handle it when the time came, and she had family and her husband to help. This was exemplified these last three years. So while she wanted to travel to see the world and help us become more aware of other cultures and landscapes, the things that she taught me while traveling went well beyond that. I am passing on my mom's love of adventure to my children, and I hope they too learn something unexpected. From the day I was born, I was a handful for mom, always giving her something to worry about. While she never liked it when I'd go skydiving or ride my motorcycle, she wouldn't get mad because she'd done it all before too. I also always wanted to do things a little differently, so she figure out a way to get on board and help out, even if my sisters did roll their eyes at me. Whether it was my resistance to dressing up and mom buying me a rubber alien tie, or me making a bike, a bike sprocket necklace I'd never take off that no one else liked, but my mom always told me she loved. One morning on my way home for Christmas, mom called and we wanted to think of a fun idea for our New Year's card. We were way too late for Christmas card. Star Wars Episode Seven: The Force Awakens had just been released, and we were all Star Wars fans, so we decided that would be a great theme. I was a bit concerned my sisters might think it was a bit over the top, to which she replied, well, they can do whatever they want for their family's cards. When I got mine in the mail from mom and dad that year, she had written, my favorite card ever. It's still in my fridge four years later. Mom either knew or made it a point to meet everyone, everywhere she went. I always felt bad for whoever on mom's staff was in charge of getting her to leave an event because she couldn't leave without saying bye to every person there. She wanted everyone to know they were special to her and she had to say a personal goodbye. They referred to it as her CLD, chronic leaving disorder. <laughs> mom valued the importance of service to others and made sure we did too. On Christmas mornings, she'd have our family wake up early and go to the Bell House, a home for people with cerebral palsy so we could cook them breakfast and allow the staff to take the morning off. She would sit and speak with every resident, help feed those that couldn't feed themselves, and share smiles and laughs with all of them. Mom has touched more lives than we could possibly know, but, was always, uh, but we always hear of more every day. When mom first got sick and had been transported to UNC, Jeanette Carey and I knew we were home when the first nurse we had in the ICU told us she was going to do everything she could to help mom because she had a favor to repay. As it turns out, a number of years before that, mom and her Senate staff helped that nurse cut through the bureaucracy to bring her own mother to the US to live with her. Mom hadn't helped that nurse all those years ago because she ever expected anything in return. She did it because it was both her job and her passion to help serve others. We all knew mom in different ways. Some of you as a Girl Scout leader, some as a banker, some as a carpool driver, and some as a senator. And while she was all of these things, to us, she was just mom. She was the mom who would say avocado instead of avocado. The mom that sang off key, but didn't care and sang anyway. The mom who called every dog we ever had him, even though we've only had female dogs. <laughs> the, the mom who grounded me, the one and only time I didn't hold the door for my grandmother. The mom who would do an arabesque on a slalom ski. The mom who'd knock on your college dorm room door just to say hi and ask if she could do laundry. The mom you'd see on vacation dancing with dad on the tabletop at an otherwise empty bar. The mom who sang to you in a rocking chair if you had a nightmare. And the mom who loved us fiercely. So mom, thank you for being Mama Kay. Thank you for making our rock of a father laugh and smile and dance with you even when you couldn't stand on your own. Thank you for making me the person I am and thank you for making Jeanette and Carrie 
into the amazing, strong women and mothers they are. And as my mom ended that Star Wars holiday card, may the force and peace be with you. In 2012, mom came home from South Africa on a congressional trip and reported that she had a new best friend, Bono. It was a story we heard a lot. The characters changed. Sean Penn, Dolly Parton, Tim Gunn, Michelle Obama, to name a few. But the story was the same. Mom was my best friend. She was my hero and my inspiration. But she was everyone's best friend after a quick conversation, everyone's hero after learning of her service to our state and our nation. And of course, everyone's inspiration after seeing her still fully energized after a long day on the campaign trail or watching her push herself during a rehab session. She had so many best friends for a simple reason. She genuinely cared about all of us, all of you. She magnified our every triumph and consoled our every defeat. Senator Schumer described her so well in his floor speech on Monday. She was an amazing force, never loud, but always strong, effective, hardworking, dedicated, principled, and just a kind-hearted person. She was KK to my three children. She was the best grandmother. She loved nothing more than to pick Harrison and Blair up early from daycare to take them to the park or the library, or ask me to delay a bottle feeding so she could bring me a latte and feed Blair his bottle herself. In the last three years, her role changed. What didn't change is the way she lit up when we entered the room. Her determination, perseverance, and strong opinions. Her love for me, for my brother and sister, for our kids, for my dad, and for all of you. When I remember my mom, I'll remember exactly how she was. At the kitchen counter in a yoga pose, reading the New York Times, sneaking another sliver of chocolate cake before she went to bed, worrying, loving, her laugh, and her smile. I'll remember the close friends and family who have embraced us over these last few years. And I'll do my best to model her resiliency and compassion for our children. You see, I get my message from the top. <laughs> what an amazing inspiration to hear Kay Hagan's children I see her through them, and wow, is it hard to follow that. But Chip, thank you at least for putting me before the great orator, Senator Claire McCaskill. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's wonderful as a Presbyterian elder to be in this amazing church. And Kristen and I are here because we are friends with and fans of Kay Hagan. And it's an honor for me to share with you my thoughts on this day of the celebration of her life. From presidents to people at home, we called her Kay. I first got to know Kay in the 90s when I was the state senate majority leader and my job was to recruit good candidates to run for the state legislature. Now, the last time I saw Kay, a few months ago, we laughed because here it is 20 years later, and my job is still recruiting good candidates to run for the state <laughs> legislature. But when Kay agreed to run for the state senate, we found out pretty soon that we had struck gold. You could spend one day, one hour, one minute with Kay. Didn't matter. 
you'd see right away her strength, her smarts, her commitment to public service. Kay was a spark plug. Just no other way to describe it. When she walked into a room, you felt her energy and you sensed her spirit. You certainly heard her laugh. People would actually gravitate toward her. And as a candidate recruiter, I could tell she was something special. Kay went to Raleigh, and our state is better for it. This community is better for it. And because she went to Washington, our nation is better for it. Kay blazed many trails in her life, but even as she soared to the highest levels of government, she never forgot what mattered, and she never forgot who mattered. Our military families and veterans, local businesses and people working hard to make ends meet, moms, dads, kids without health care, teachers always doing more with less. Kay knew that relevance was about results. It didn't matter if you could shout the loudest or make the biggest scene. She knew that she had to reach across the aisle, roll up her sleeves, and do the work. And Kay, she did the work, and she got the job done. As she continued in her career, Kay, once the recruited, became the recruiter, issuing a clarion call to get more young people, and in particular, more young women, to serve their communities and run for office. She made her pitch in countless classrooms across North Carolina, and we'll never know exactly how many people she inspired, but we no doubt will feel her impact through them. I know that there are people working, young women working on my staff right now who would not be there but for the inspiration of Kay Hagan. Though we mourn in our hearts today, it is a day to remember, a day to celebrate, and a day to be thankful for the legacy that Kay has left us. And so much of her legacy lives on in her family. And what a family it is. They turned Kay's tragic illness into a glue that pulled them all closer together. With Kay in her last few years, limited speech and movement gave way to limitless smiles and love. And her family was right there all the time, smiling and loving with her. Jeanette, Tilden, Carrie, her grandchildren, her many nieces and nephews, all kinds of cousins, and of course her beloved Chip. To see Chip and Kay was to witness true partnership, genuine devotion, and most sincere love. Our prayers and our wishes, we hope they comfort you, my friendship, and your entire family. And as we reflect on Kay's life, let us all take a lesson from her example. Focus on what matters. Laugh when life's funny. Serve others when you can. Try to turn tragedy into triumph. Walk with love in your heart, and people will see the joy reflected in themselves. Oh God, for our friend Kay Hagan, open wide your gates as she strides happily into your house with many rooms, smiling and talking and dancing and loving. And, oh God, we thank you for all of the work done by this, your good and faithful servant. Amen. 
First, I want to thank Chip and Carrie and Tilden and Jeanette for this incredible honor. There was news coverage. A new senator, a new woman senator, just wanted to swim in the very small <laughs> Senate swimming pool. But women senators were not allowed in that very small Senate swimming pool because some of the male senators like to swim without their swim trunks on. Well, she wanted to swim. In some ways, Kay's success in breaking up the all-male and sometimes naked Senate swimming In some ways, it got way too much attention. Even though it was a hoot when Kay left the Senate that the women senators, we had our goodbye party for Kay at that swimming pool. <laughs> Kay was so much bigger than the fight about the pool. She was substantive, head down, hard work, no grandstander no sharp elbows, laboring to elevate the voices that had no lobbyist, working her hardest to take care of the state, this state, that she cared so deeply about. You can measure a person by the love of those people who work for them. Look around this church, and as Chip pointed out earlier, dozens and dozens of people have come from all over the country to be here today. Dozens and dozens of people who called her boss. They loved her. They respected her. They saw her heart. And I hear her correcting me right now. Claire, they didn't work for me, they worked with me. She was that kind of senator. No entourage, no posse, nobody holding her bag. She just went from person to person, whether it was the people working the elevators, serving the food in the cafeteria, or the majority floor leader. They were all the same to Kay. Team K was a very happy place, full of dedication and an ethos of true public service. And that was because of her. Fierce intelligence and a doggedness that was disguised by her good manners. Underestimated constantly, she fought back with determination and a spine of steel. And so darn smart. I would have used another word, but we're in church. <laughs> Whip smart. But she had a giant soft spot. She would find me on the floor, and we would go huddle. We would be talking with our heads close together. Probably a lot of our colleagues believed we were discussing a tough vote. And she and I had a lot of tough votes. Or our work on the Armed Services Committee. Or about the amendment on the floor. Nope. It was all about our children. About Carrie and Jeanette's wedding. About her first grandchild about Tilden's work, about our families, about unfair attacks on our husbands. Our hopes, our fears, our excitement, our love for Kay, it was all about her children and her family. And all of us, stand in awe of her family today. You all, Chip, the kids, her precious grandchildren, the very large extended family, 
never gave up, never quit trying to give her the best days possible. We are tremendously proud of you and grateful for your hard work. Country Western singer Tim McGraw had a big hit lately. I'm from Missouri, so I know it's okay to quote a country western song at a funeral. <laughs> and by the way, Tim McGraw is a Democrat. Sorry, Richard. <laughs> he recently had a hit that perfectly described R.K. Humble and kind. And here is one of the verses. Hold the door. Say please, say thank you. Don't steal, don't cheat, don't lie. I know you got mountains to climb, but always stay humble and kind. When the dreams you're dreaming come to you, when the work you put in is realized, let yourself feel the pride, but always stay humble and kind. She always was humble and kind.